Good day, everybody, and thank you so much for joining this Ask the Experts webinar that we put together. Um, this was born out of really um, our understanding that uh, during the live conferences and on our webinars, really the question and answer section um, and the back and forth that happens among the faculty are really the most popular things that happen. Um, and so we decided, let's just do a whole webinar of that. And I think you guys are going to really enjoy this. We've taken a number of questions. Um, that have been pre-registered. Um, also, you can submit questions in the Q&A portal. We'll try to get to as many as we can, but there were a lot submitted, so we're going to break this up into topics. Um, we searched far and wide for the world experts, the best that we could find to come on and be panelists for this. And when none of those guys were available, we flipped over a few rocks and the folks you see on your screen came crawling out. No, I, I, I kid, of course. We, we love our panelists. We love our specialists. These guys are... are um, Absolutely great. So we are going to um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Are there other slides that we need to talk about? I apologize. There we go. This, yeah, let's introduce the let's introduce the panelists. Why not? Uh, so I'm moderating. My name is Arthur Allen, anticoagulation program manager at the VA hospital in Salt Lake City. Uh, we have the uh, um, lovely and talented Jeff Barnes, uh, associate professor of internal medicine, University of Michigan. We have the brilliant Adam Suker, uh, the director. Uh, Penn State Comprehensive and Hemophilia uh, Thrombosis Program, Clinical Director of Penn uh, Blood Disorder Center, Section Chief of Hematology, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, we have Andrea Van Beek, the current member of uh, the ACE Forum Board of Directors, uh, as is Jeff Barnes, by the way, myself, uh, Nurse Practitioner, Anticoagulation and Thrombosis Service in Vesalia Medical Clinic. Uh, and we have Deshoy Rugged, my friend and, uh, and a partner in crime. Uh, anticoagulation clinical pharmacist practitioner uh, at the Veterans Affairs Eastern Colorado Healthcare System, also a board member. And we have Vera, uh, Sarah Vasquez, clinical pharmacist, University of Utah. All right. Any other slides we need to get before we dig into this thing? I don't think so. I'll just stop sharing and then I think our All panel right. will pop up, right? I apologize ahead of time for my bald head getting bigger on your screen, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and kick this thing off. We have a few topics. We want to try to stay um, within some topics. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to kick it off with Jeff Barnes um, with a question about AFib burden. So we see this um, come up. We now have all these capabilities of kind of 24 hours, seven days a week monitoring. We have, been, we have implantable loop recorders. We have people with pacemakers that can be interrogated. And sometimes we, we see AFib, but these patients aren't being anticoagulated. Um, and I know that there is a upcoming trial, the Artesia trial, that's hopefully going to be uh, published soon to help us understand some of this. But what do we do with AFib burden and how do cardiologists and EP doctors kind of decide about anticoagulation therapy based on burden? Yeah, thanks, Arthur. It's, it's a good question. When we talk about AFib burden, we're talking about this for patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, meaning sometimes they're in AFib, sometimes they're in normal sinus rhythm. And the burden is really the amount of time that they spend in AFib, usually measured in terms of either minutes or hours. So if you're wearing, a, let's say, an event monitor for seven days, are you spending you know, two to three minutes at a time in AFib, or are you spending six or 12 hours a day in AFib? And as you would imagine, our observational studies say the more time you're in AFib, the higher your risk of stroke. So as we think about anticoagulation or stroke uh, prevention efforts, it's really integrating the stroke risk factors, Chad's mask, with the AFib burden. So somebody who's at very low risk of stroke, maybe a Chad's mask of one or two, but who has exceptionally high AFib burden, we may treat differently than somebody who's at a very low AFib burden. And so you integrate those two pieces of data to determine who should be treated with anticoagulation. Chad's vast tends to be the much stronger uh, deciding factor, but sometimes we bring that burden piece in as well. So, so to follow up on that, do, do we know the magic number uh, at which point we anticoagulate above this amount of AFib? You anticoagulate below this, we don't. Yeah, no, we don't have that magic number. Some studies have suggested it could be as little as six minutes a day is the threshold. Others have said, no, it's more like six to 12 hours. So um, we don't have an answer except that the more AFib, the higher the risk of stroke. And so you just have to kind of make a qualitative decision. Thank you. Yeah, and again, I think that the, uh, I think the Artesia trial is supposed to be 
uh, announced at AHA, if I'm not mistaken, and that might help us answer this question a bit. So thank you. Stay for tuned. Your, anybody else have uh, have thoughts on that uh, particular topic? Okay, Bishoy, you're our, you're our next you're our next uh, our next panelist up for discussion. Um, AFib, uh, your preferred anticoagulations anticoagulation strategy, vitamin K, DOAX, um, and you know if if is there this net harm you know in, in patients with end stage renal disease um, with anticoagulating them? We know that there's some controversy. Should we even anticoagulate these patients? Um, and if using um, a DOAC, can we talk a little bit about dosing strategy? Do we automatically go to a lower dose? Do we keep them on the dose dependent on their age, renal function, and weight like we normally would? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and I feel like I'm cheating a little bit because actually uh, Jeff and a group of his published a paper recently. Um, I believe it's titled Anticoagulation and Chronic Kidney Disease Current Status and Future Perspectives. Um, and you can actually find that on the, uh, the literature database at the Centers of Excellence and AC Forum website, and it will be highlighted in the upcoming rapid recap. But um, essentially, there is use of anticoagulation in end-stage renal disease as a whole is unclear at this point. We don't know if there's actual benefit. Um, what we've seen in some meta-analyses, especially one from 2020 that looked at approximately 50,000 patients uh, of what happens with warfarin versus no anticoagulation. And there was a, a signal there to show that there actually may be even more harm with no benefit from a stroke uh, prevention standpoint. Um, the guidelines would tell you it's highly individualized. So we can't take a blanket statement. Um, we have to take in a bunch of factors and really look at the patient's bleeding risk as a whole, as well as thrombotic risk. I would say though, if anticoagulation is chosen, what the data seems to suggest at this point is that apixaban outperforms warfarin from what we can tell. We did have two uh, randomized control trials. Unfortunately, they were either too small or they weren't powered enough to really uh, show too much um, in the sense of a conclusion. But from what we can tell from registry uh, data and, and big data is that apixaban overall seems to perform better. In the sense of what dose to use, um, the guidelines initially when they came out said two and a half is reasonable, but the data seems to suggest that five milligrams are the standard dosing um, or don't, in other words, uh, non-off-label dosing or licensed dosing is probably the preferred uh, route. Um, you'll get better stroke uh, prevention, um, but that's kind of where the data sits at this point. Still very clear and murky. Um, thankfully, I think we have a safe D trial that's going to hopefully release soon, and that'll kind of show us the difference between, uh, I think, apixaban versus warfarin versus uh, no anticoagulation overall. I could actually just follow up on that real quick and ask Adam. So Adam, you've done some laboratory work, um, some, some, some work with uh, 10 a levels and that kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the, the labeled dosing for a, if a patient doesn't meet the two out of three criteria and, and their only one criteria is dialysis or end-stage renal disease, let's say they would still be on the higher, higher dose. There's been some laboratory data suggest, I, I should say some, pharmacokinetic modeling data that suggests wonders if that's the right the right move. From someone who's worked with laboratory data and antitonate levels, what are what is your opinion on on uh, on dosing of AFib uh, in 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 uh, in stage renal disease dialysis? Thanks, Arthur. Yeah, and so I am a proponent of lab testing, but I I really don't like the idea of lab monitoring anticoagulants when there aren't outcome data tied to the monitoring results. And that's, of course, the world that we would be in with DOAC. So we could check a lab, uh, an apixaban level and somebody with end-stage renal disease on five milligrams twice daily. And maybe we would find, based on some of the studies that I've read as well, that at least in some of those patients, um, the, the, the trough levels would be greater than the 95% percentile trough that was reported in larger pharmacokinetic studies of people without end-stage renal disease. But what does that mean? Does that mean the patient is more likely to bleed? It, it might, but I would really like to see clinical studies with um, out clinical outcomes that to drive my practice rather than using lab results that haven't been tied to clinical outcomes. Yeah. 
you know, and kind of along those lines, we start to think about like obesity and, you know, doing levels in, in those sort of situations. Sarah, maybe can you touch a little bit on like the current stance of where we're at with DOAX um, in obesity across indications, you know, AFib, VTE, should we be checking levels? What do we do um, with our super obese patients? You know, are we okay to use DOAX in those, those populations? Yeah, Andrew, I think it's a very contemporary dilemma that we've had. And, you know, we we felt a little bit stuck because we didn't know and it, there was some uncertainty for a while. And then uh, with the ISTH statement in 2021 regarding use of DOAX in obesity for VTE, we got a little bit more clarity uh, with that in, in that it seems that obese patients tend to do just as well on DOAX as the general population. And so practically speaking, I feel very comfortable using DOAX um, for both indications, AFib uh, and VTE in obese patients. Um, I think there's a lot less data on the um, extremely um, high BMI patients. Um, but I think I, I always think about it in terms of, well, would this be potentially worse than poorly managed warfarin? Uh, and kind of think about it um, in, in that line. But I think the data seem promising that patients do quite well on DOAX irrespective of weight. And just to add yeah, on to that, one, one more just clarifying question. So if a patient has gotten past that initial six months of, of therapy for, for VTE, and we're thinking about dose reducing in those populations, would you consider just continuing on full dose or would we, we dose reduce or does it kind of depend on the patient? I I think my, my personal opinion is if there's no clinical difference between standard dose and reduced dose in a non-evidence-based way, I probably leave people on the standard dose just to make myself feel better. Um, I don't think there's evidence to support that necessarily, but that's my practice. I think yeah, so. I yeah. Yeah. yeah, you agree. So I, I was going to, going to ask kind of like, you know, pull, pull the panel number one, with the obesity question, um, I would go as far as to say that clinically, we've not seen a signal of therapeutic failure in either atrial fibrillation or venous thrombosis. Do you all agree with that statement? Okay, I wanna make sure I haven't missed anything. I agree that there are some unanswered questions, but we've not seen a signal. And this has been looked up, looked at high and low and from every angle. I mean, every, there's been a lot of published in the obesity literature. And I really think that in my opinion, this this issue has been mostly put to bed um, with regard to to obesity. Um, I really wanted to talk separately about the about the issue of of dose reducing, but um, my I would also again pull the panel. My my stance on the dose reducing for VTE secondary VTE prevention is: Does the patient look like the patients in the trials? That has been kind of my approach. And if they don't look like patients in the trials, um, they kind of have that morbid obesity, perhaps they have induction drug-drug interactions, perhaps they look scarier from a thromboembolic standpoint. Um, you don't get much in the patient studied. You don't get much for dose reducing. We know this. Um, no difference in clinical outcomes from a, from a TE standpoint, and no, not even any difference in major bleeding, really just minor clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So my, my stance has, to be, has been, does the patient look like the patients in the trial and have a low threshold for just not dose reducing if you're worried? Does, do others differ in that opinion? No, I, I think that's a reasonable way to think about it. The other thing is, why are you dose reducing in the first place? And I find one of the most compelling reasons is patients who are sort of a little wishy-washy about staying on an anticoagulant long-term, when I can say to them, there's this opportunity to cut your dose in half but still protect you against another blood clot, that often makes them feel really good. And it's a way for me to know that they're getting the protection of secondary prophylaxis or that secondary prevention against VTE. So there's almost a psychological element, perhaps even more so than a medical element about saying, how do we get you on long-term preventive therapy so you don't have recurrence? Yeah, and I, I agree, I, completely... I use that approach as well. Um, yeah, as as a negotiated compromise or a carrot to continue anticoagulation therapy when they're really on the fence or hesitant. I agree with Jeff. 
Well, and the other thing in, in my experience is that patients, uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings in the medical world is diseases don't read textbooks, right? And so these patients don't necessarily always line up with, oh, it was very clearly transient risk factors that caused the clot, or it was very clearly their ongoing risk factors. They don't always line up in that, and we don't always know the best approach. And so having, um, I hate to call it a middle of the road approach, but having something that might give you a lower threshold for continuing long-term therapy, perhaps slightly safer, uh, I think is a, is a nice tool in the tool bag. So I do want to jump back though um, to atrial fit fibrillation, if we could, Jeff. Um, you know, we see patients who've had, um, we know a bit about left atrial, about the left atrial appendage and AFED, and maybe you want to go over that. And about left atrial appendage occlusion uh, or exclusion as, as an option, specifically targeted at patients with chronic AFib. We hear that talked about with Watchmen, with the Amulet mm -hmm. device and so on, um, Lariat devices, things like that. But um, we often see patients who've undergone cardiothoracic surgery for cabbage aortic valve replacement. And as part of that, you see that they're having maze and they're having either left atrial appendage ligation or clipping. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about why that's done, what we really know about that, and whether or not that correlates to decisions about um, anticoagulating AFib patients down the road? Yeah, so, so two separate issues here. So the first is the maze procedure. What is that? Essentially, during an open heart surgery, a surgeon will go in and create scar tissue. They'll essentially create some scars inside the left atrium. Uh, Ideally, what they're trying to do is isolate those pulmonary veins where all the electrical activity that causes AFib comes from so that it doesn't get into the rest of the heart. And by doing that, they can greatly reduce the likelihood that a patient will ever go into AFib in the future. So you're creating a scar. It's much like the ablation procedures. It's just done surgically. So a maze procedure is done to reduce the burden or even the presence of AFib. The ligation is essentially from the outside, they uh, they either tie off or clip off that left atrial appendage as a way to get rid of that tissue. The theory being by not having that space, think of it as like a closet inside your room. If you get rid of that closet, there's no place for the blood to go in. You won't have a clot form. You lower the risk of stroke. The best quality data we have came out a couple years ago uh, and essentially showed that with that ligation procedure and anticoagulation, you're able to reduce the risk of stroke. So if you have known AFib and you continue to have AFib, even if you've had that ligation procedure done, the best evidence would say you should still be on anticoagulation. Now, many clinicians will say, gosh, if I'm not seeing any AFib afterwards, maybe I'll choose to stop it. And that's a decision they can make. We don't have randomized trial data to support that. Uh, but that's really where those two pieces play into to AFib management. Thank you. It's my, it's my understanding that the data behind doing it and the rationale to do it has more to do with the fact that cardiothoracic surgery is very provocative for causing atrial fibrillation, often transient, often episodic. Um, and that any data about stroke prevention, most of the data, I should say, about stroke prevention in that setting it really had to do with if they had cardiothoracic surgery and we caused them to go into AFib, then in the short term, we reduce the risk of them having a stroke because of that in the postoperative phase. Is that correct? That's kind of been my understanding of why they do it. That, that I would say that is a large thrust, but there is sort of long-term benefit both from having the MACE procedure, reducing the incidence of AFib in people who are maybe paroxysmal. So if you're a paroxysmal AFib person, we'll ask the surgeon to do a MACE and with that ligation procedure. In combination with anticoagulation, it's lowering the risk of stroke. So it started as a thrust in the post-op period, but it does have some longer-term benefits. So to, to your point about not continuing uh, uh, or about continuing long-term therapy, despite having had this external clipping or ligation, I once met an EP doctor back in the early days of Watchmen who had successfully deployed the first generation Watchmen in a patient who had had a left atrial appendage ligation. So this goes to show that clipping this from the outside does not um, really do that much um, to fully occlude like a Watchmen device would. So thank you. Yeah. Along sort of a similar thread, kind of keeping with the intracardiac kind of questions, 
uh, maybe Jeff or someone else can, can chime in as well um, about cardiac thrombosis. Um, so intracardiac thrombosis, what's our best um, option for treatment? Do we, do we do just warfarin? Do we, is there any evidence for the DOACs? Can you maybe expand on that a bit? So, so great question. And in this case, we're not talking about the left atrial thrombus, which is usually afibrillated. We're almost always talking about left ventricular thrombus, uh, usually in a patient who's had heart failure. So their left ventricle is enlarged and not squeezing well. And this really became an issue uh, several years ago when that first observational study came out, suggesting there may be more harm with DOAC therapy compared to warfarin therapy. Since then, there have been several other observational studies and even a couple prospective smaller studies that have come out showing either equivalent outcomes or even better outcomes with DOAC as compared to warfarin. So my current read of this is really the best thing you can do for the patient is give them the anticoagulant they're actually going to take. And for me, most of my patients would prefer to be on a DOAC because of the ease of use and administration as compared to warfarin. And I just have to explain to them, this has never been tested in a prospective trial. This is off-label use of these drugs, but we do have a lot of data to suggest that the DOACs are probably effective as long as they're taking them every day. Great. Thanks, Jeff. And I would highlight that recently AC Forum published a rapid resource on, on left ventricular thrombus. And really, LV thrombus is now being kind of thought about in two different pathways. One, the acute thrombus that occurs in the setting of acute coronary injury, um, uh, and the, and the, which is where really all of the prior guidelines and data and how we think about it, how cardiologists practice around it, were driven by that phase. But really what we see very often these days is less LV thrombus in the setting of acute MI and more LV thrombus that's maybe been there for a long time by the time you diagnose it, they have LV, LV aneurysms or they have really bad LV function. And so those are really kind of two different pathways I'd reference and point you to that rapid resource. It was really does a good job of explaining that. Um, all right. I want to, I don't want to um, stay too long on the same topic. Let's um, let me jump to Adam. Let me, let me change topics slightly here. Um, Adam, we have pretty, decent guidance about what to do for VTE durations. I would point out, however, um, that, you know, even for lower extremity clots and um, the, the guidance is really specific. Anything that suggests long-term therapy is really talking about proximal DVT. And there's some a little bit less known about distal DVT, upper extremity DVT, SVT, um, even I would argue um, of subsegmental PE. But we often don't have great guidance or great ideas on what to do for um, for clots in, in unusual location. So we see a lot of splanchnic vein thrombosis, often in cirrhotics, but often not. Um, we've, you know, cerebral vein thrombosis, renal vein thrombosis. Can you give us kind of a, just a clinic, if you will, on uh, these odd location um, clots provoked versus unprovoked and what we should be thinking about when we see them? Sure. Thanks, Arthur. So you hit the nail on the head that there's a dearth of evidence to guide management in this in this area. And so my practice is based on indirect evidence from the DVT PE literature. And so if somebody has a splanchnic vein thrombosis provoked by a transient risk factor, for example, somebody who has abdominal surgery and develops portal vein thrombosis afterward, I'm typically going to anticoagulate that patient for three months. On the other hand, if the patient has uh, 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 clot in unusual clay, uh, location that's unprovoked. Um, it could be splanchnic vein, cerebral sinus, what have you, or that's provoked by a chronic risk factor like myeloproliferative neoplasm or, or paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. In, in those patients, I'm more inclined to recommend uh, indefinite anticoagulation as long as they're, um, you know, they're not at exceptionally high bleeding risk. Excellent. Thank you. Other, so let me ask just as a follow up on that, Sarah, what do you see with regard to what kind of guidance are you given in, in the anticoag clinic? You're seeing these clots. Are you given guidance? Are you clear on who's making the decisions on duration of these, or do you often have to jump into this? So for um, cerebral sinus thrombosis, most of the time neurology is making the call on duration of therapy for those. Most of the time they like to re-image at three or six months and use um, imaging to guide duration of therapy. Um, for splanchnic vein thrombosis, that is 
a little bit of a no man's land. And so thrombosis ends up, um, at least our institution, either hematology or thrombosis ends up um, addressing those. Um, and so that's, that's at least how our practice is. I don't know what others are like. Sarah, I can jump in here with um, splanchnic vein thrombosis. It's really important to separate between those that are related to cirrhosis. And so you've got mm -hmm. portal hypertension and there's kind of a separate treatment pathway and obviously separate implications for the drugs you might choose as compared to those patients who don't have advanced forms of cirrhosis and treatment. And so we find that our liver doctors are really managing the cirro cirrhotic uh, associated, especially portal vein thrombosis. Um, and yet all the others, you know, like Adam mentioned the post-operative or maybe somebody who had a cancer associated or it's, uh, you know, a, a, an unusual thrombophilia associated one, those will tend to fall into, you know, the thrombosis clinic, uh, the hematology clinic, things like that. Yeah. And, and just as a, as a reminder, folks, that, that, you know, it's not when it comes to portal vein thrombosis, other things in the splenic system, it's not just cirrhosis or not. It's cirrhosis commonly, usually ongoing risk factor. You have completely came out of, out of, you know, left field. We have no idea where this came from. That would be in um, a kind of this unprovoked, odd location where you may be thinking about, like, maybe the patient has a thrombophilia or something. And in this middle of the road, there are other provoking factors that can cause specifically splanchnic vein clots. Patients hospitalized with pancreatitis. Had a patient yesterday, bad di diverticulitis and, uh, and, a, and a, a, um, a peritonitis. Uh, and you got a, a splanchnic vein thrombosis. So some of those may be provoked and explained and treated similarly to what we might do in the lower extremity. But um, really, I think the question often is, is it provoked? Are there ongoing risk factors? Um, or is it completely unexplained and makes me scratch my head? You agree with that, Adam? But uh, so you see so you're nodding your head. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's very much like what we do with DVTPE in the yeah. usual location. And I'll, and I'll just also add, I, I know the neurologists are not here to defend themselves, but... <laughs> I don't think it makes sense to use imaging to guide this decision personally, because what you might see with imaging um, after a few months is chronic, the presence of chronic thrombosis or not. And and I, I personally <clears> don't think <throat> that's likely to be an appropriate criterion to use when deciding about the patient's risk of recurrence and whether you should you know stop after a few months or provide indefinite treatment. Yeah. You know, and along that, that same line, Adam, we're, we're, you know, since we're discussing natural history of thrombosis and, and things like that, Jeff, I'm wondering if you can maybe help us understand a little bit more about VTE and, um, you know, kind of the natural history, you know, anticoagulants, we know they do not dissolve blood clots. They prevent clots, new clots from forming, prevent extension. And so over time, typically clots either endothelialize or maybe they disappear and so we treat patients, you know, for that three to six months, but afterwards we get another scan to establish a new baseline. We see chronic clot and do we keep the patient on anticoagulation? Do we stop it? Uh, how do we sort of make those decisions? Can you kind of guide yeah. us on, on that a bit? Yeah. I, and, and this is, um, there, there are some facts and then there's some opinions. And so I'll, I'll try and uh, differentiate the two here. So you are absolutely right. It is a fact. Anticoagulants do not dissolve clots, no matter how many people say that, no matter how many patients believe that. The anticoagulant's job is to prevent a new thrombotic event from occurring or expansion of the current thrombosis, right? So then your body's natural clot dissolving activities, your body naturally has TPA and other uh, other ways to dissolve clot. That activity can go on because there's not new clot forming. That's the reason we treat people with anticoagulants. It's to prevent the new clot from forming. So this question about what happens, well, over time, your body may dissolve the clot away so that it's not seen anymore on an ultrasound or a CT or a venogram, or that clot may start to evolve and it may start to fibrose and turn into more of like scar tissue. This is certainly what we see in the legs. This is the post-thrombotic syndrome where we'll see that chronic clot or what really should be called chronic scar tissue that can impact the, the veins, uh, the valves of the veins and, and lead to post-thrombotic syndrome. It's also what happens in the pulmonary arteries. And that's why we get evidence of chronic thrombombolic disease and chronic thrombombolic pulmonary hypertension. And so when you choose to do an ultrasound for follow-up, and this is where I'm going to now move more into the opinion piece, the data has been mixed as to whether that's actually a good predictor of recurrence risk. Sure, we can see that there's now evidence of some obstructive um, thing there. Usually it's more scar tissue. 
Whether that's actually predicting your risk of VTE recurrence or not is debatable. Whether you even need to get that ultrasound is something a little bit of personal opinion. I'm somebody who tends to minimize testing, so I don't routinely get that. However, I have many colleagues who do, so that way they know here's where the patient was at after three to six months. So when they come back with new symptoms, we know whether it's new or old. And I absolutely cannot disagree with that approach. So uh, I just want to make sure you know why you're getting that scan and whether there's a lot of evidence behind that as a guiding factor. Yeah, and this so is one of the things. Oh, I'm sorry. Hit it no, go ahead. Go ahead, Arthur. Yeah, this this is one of the things where I think that we have this understanding, but maybe many providers don't. Um, very, very commonly, when you're dealing with primary care providers, dealing with with ER providers, um, that perhaps don't fully understand um, the natural history of clot, um, and patients it just naturally, oh, you tell me I had a blood clot, you put me on a pill for it. It should, I should stay on that until it goes away. That's the assumption. And often providers follow along in that as well. Um, and so I think that it's very important that we as anticoagulation providers understand the truth about this so that we can help teach our staff that it's not, it's not the right goal. It's not the right target. I tell my patients beyond three to six months of therapy, we completely change mindsets. We're no longer concerned about the clot you have. It's, it's a, treated as it's going to be. Um, if we keep you on therapy, it's because we're concerned about, we are concerned enough about you having another one that we think you justify being on anticoagulant. And yet um, we see providers ordering repeat ultrasounds, guiding therapy based on it. There was in 2021, a European guideline that actually did include language that it's reasonable to get a baseline, uh, to get a, a repeat ultrasound to establish a new baseline. Really, this is in patients who are stopping therapy. Because if that same patient goes to a different hospital, his leg swells up, they do an ultrasound, they go, look, there's clot there. Um, that will be assumed to be a, an acute clot, and very often it's not. Um, just tossing really quickly to uh, Bishoy and, and Sarah, um, what are you seeing in your practice related to this? Do you, do you, get, you see patients and providers confused on this topic um, and, and, and doing things that, necess that don't necessarily make sense based on our guidance and natural history of VTE? Sarah, you can go. I will say, yes, there's a lot of confusion and it's a very logical question that patients have, as you alluded to, you know, it's like, okay, well, if I'm stopping therapy, the clot must be gone. Right. And I think one thing that we can do, and I've been trying to do differently in my practice is from the very beginning, give patients a reasonable expectation of what the long-term outcome might be. In terms of, I think everyone has this assumption of I'm going to take a medication, it's going to quote, dissolve the clot and it's going to be gone and my leg will be normal in three months. And the reality is, you know, 50% of people perhaps may not have a normal leg at the end of three months or six months or ever. And so trying to set a reasonable expectation for them about what, you know, the outcomes are, you know, our outcome is preventing new clot. And if you have no new clot, that's, that's a success. It's not restoring. Our goal is not restoring your leg to, um, how it was prior to your clot. So that's, that's something that I would like to highlight. And I've been trying to work on. Yeah. Be, be sure. Yeah. What do you see? And do you have to end up talking to them about post-thrombotic syndrome and bowel damage and all of this kind of stuff? No, exactly. It's uh, based, educating because a lot of the concern comes from the patient. They want to know what their leg looks like. Is the clot gone? Yeah. So when you frame it to the patient and you say, hey, I can do this ultrasound again, but I want you to know what this means and what it, it means for future uh, decisions. I'll give another example of when um, I've personally done a repeat ultrasound or when patients would have uh, deemed as a DOAC failure. Um, and then you dig down a little bit deeper into their history and you might've found out they were taking their Pixaban once a day or the Zeralta without food. Um, and you're like, you know, I don't really know if this was really deemed a failure and you've had multiple imaging from various sites and no one's really compared it. If you're open for a DOAC, we'll put you back on it. We'll do an ultrasound right before. And if you're symptomatic again, let's be sure we, we compare to this image here. Um, and that way we keep options open for patients. I think it's so, that's so important. And a lot of the calls that I get are, um, you know, this patient had a blood clot. We know that we, we know that he had a blood clot. He now, he, he now comes, comes in, has some symptoms and has this done. And I think that, that patients and providers alike need to understand 
there's a high incidence of at least some post thrombotic syndrome after after DVT. Um, that can mean long, uh, you know, swelling, uh, you know, long term. I've actually seen providers say we're going to keep the patient on the anticoagulant because it's still swelling. Not the target, not the goal, not the symptom. Maybe maybe permanent. Sorry about that. Um, compression <laughs> is the best you can do, you know. Um, and so I get a lot of calls for the patients in, in, in the ED. Um, he had, you know, ultrasound says clot. He had a similar clot before, or the ultrasound read it as chronic, which is, you know, there are some signs, but you, but if it, we're, we're talking about bouncing sound waves off of stuff, people. I mean, <laughs> to make diagnoses, I mean, how accurate can we really be? Um, so, I mean, Jeff, what do you, I, I know you and I have had chat, chats about this before. Like when you see um, what what steps should be taken when a patient comes in, we know they've had a history of clot, they're perhaps having some swelling, they're, even, they're either having a clot that we know looks like what they've had before, or, um, uh, or the ultrasound is reading as chronic or scar or remote or those, those, those terms that you can report. What, what, what do we do? Yeah, I, it's really important to understand what post-thrombotic syndrome is. The fact that it can be episodic and can have flares, which may look a lot like an acute DVT. And so understanding what kind of treatment you're giving a patient for post-thrombotic syndrome is critical. Is the patient getting really good compression and are they wearing that compression? Are they elevating their legs frequently at least one time during the day plus at night? Are they ambulating for at least 30 minutes a day to help with that calf muscle pump that helps to move uh, uh, blood along? You know, really leaning into that to understand whether they're getting the best treatment for post-thrombotic syndrome is important. And then looking at that ultrasound. So if they come back with new symptoms, somebody gets an ultrasound, are you seeing new segments of the vein that are involved? Are you seeing clear evidence of an acute DVT, meaning that it's an enlarged vein, maybe that clot is sort of flowing in the middle of the vein rather than adhering to the edge of the wall, things like that. That's how you can sort of differentiate between whether this is a chronic post-thrombotic syndrome process or whether this may actually be a recurrent acute DVT on top of a previous process. Great. Well, yeah, I see that quite a bit. And I find myself having to, you know, go back and review ultrasounds more than perhaps I, you know, folks with anticoagulation should, but it doesn't seem like other folks are doing that. I'm sorry, who did I interrupt? Somebody was nope, chatting. Nope, you're good. Me? You're good. You're good. I was going to change. I was going to, I was just going to segue us a little bit into warfarin management because I know a lot of the folks that are on this call are definitely doing warfarin management day to day. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Adam this question um, about long term negative effects of warfarin, um, not bleeding, um, but things that we, we kind of hear about, like bone, tooth health, um, hair loss. Even we, we've, we've heard rumors about dementia. And so are, are these, are these things we need to be monitoring, um, or evaluating for, do we need to be considering doing bone densities on our, our patients or making sure the primary is following that? Um, and then are these, these side effects of warfarin potentially mitigated by switching to an, a different agent like a DOAC? Thanks, Andrea. So I'll start and then I'm going to share this question with my pharmacy colleagues who may have a lot more to say on it. So far, everybody knows far and away the most important side effect of warfarin and all of anticoagulants is bleeding. And it dwarfs any conversation about these other side effects that we're going to talk about. I've had a few patients who've experienced alopecia on warfarin. That gets better when they stop warfarin and switch to another anticoagulant if that's an option. Um, I've seen a couple cases of calciphylaxis related to warfarin. That's a very scary complication. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen warfarin skin necrosis in a couple cases, another scary complication that can generally be avoided if um, we are doing appropriate bridging in the in the in the in the right situations. Um, I personally don't have experience with other toxicities of warfarin. I don't take care of that many patients on warfarin anymore. And I must confess that when I do, I don't discuss these other toxicities with them. We always talk about bleeding, but I do not discuss these other toxicities. So I'm very interested to hear, particularly from Bashoy and Sarah, who probably take care of thousands of patients on warfarin, what, what toxicities they discuss with their patients. Yeah, so similar approach, Adam. Um, I've been doing warfarin for about 14 years at this point, and um, I mean, really, bleeding is is the the major driver. 
um, and the sense of the other issues like alopecia and uh, and calciphylaxis and those things. I mean, we touch on them, but it's it's not major. And obviously, when we're first starting, um, the warfarin skin necrosis is is a is one that I might touch on with patients. Just say, hey, watch out for this during the first you know couple few weeks of uh, starting. Um, and then, of course, we know the purple toe syndrome. I've never experienced that. Coincidentally, my wife, who's also a pharmacist, did as a student. Um, and she saw that, but besides that, we haven't seen it. So I don't get into things like bone density testing and, uh, and, and all that. I just don't think there's a very high net, uh, yield for it. So, um, happy to be dissuaded otherwise. Sarah, do you have any thoughts? No, I would agree with both Adam and Bishoy. I don't have anything to add there. My only thought is that apparently working with warfarin also causes alopecia because uh, I had hair when I first started working with warfarin and look at this now. So um, Adam, if you want to get together, we'll write a case report. Um, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, and let's get, let's jump back to Adam. I'm not going to let him get away with it. Uh, we're going to have to come back to him and, uh, and keep him under the gun. Can you talk to us a bit? I know, you know, we, we did a webinar on thrombophilia and APS testing in response to belief to a rapid re resource that, um, that AC form also has on, um, on their website, but um, can you talk to us a bit about the, the APS antibodies, their impact on INR testing, whether or not that's specific to point of care testing or laboratory testing as well. And then what do you do with that? Can maybe, maybe give, give us a little bit of a, of a primer on chromogenic factor 10 um, monitoring. Sure, Arthur. Yeah, I can give that a shot. So mm -hmm. as, as this audience knows, when we do antiphospholipid antibody testing, we're sort of testing for three things, a lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin antibodies, and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies. And anticardiolipin and anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibody measurements are done by ELISA, and they're completely unaffected by warfarin or other anticoagulants. So you don't have to worry about them. Warfarin can interfere with lupus anticoagulant testing, but we have some pretty good ways around it. Um, it's, I think, much more of an issue with the DOAX, which can interfere with lupus anticoagulant testing. And in most cases, we probably shouldn't be doing lupus anticoagulant testing in somebody who's on a DOAC because you get abnormal results and don't know what they mean. Um, the point of care, so there are most patients with antiphospholipid syndrome have a normal baseline INR. And we're all very comfortable using warfarin in those patients and using a standard therapeutic range. But there are occasional patients with antiphospholipid antibodies who have an abnormal baseline INR. And if the INR is above you know, 1.5 or higher, it makes me, first, I want to know why is it elevated? Is it interference from the lupus anticoagulant? Is it for some other reason? And your special coagulation lab should be able to sort that out. And if, if, it, if, it's, if it's abnormal at baseline above 1.5 due to interference from a lupus anticoagulant, um, one of the, you know, you probably don't want to use the INR for warfarin monitoring. So an alternative would be to use a factor 10 assay, either a, a, a one-stage clotting factor 10 assay or a uh, chromogenic factor 10 assay. Um, and generally there, we would be aiming for levels between 20 and 40%, which we think is roughly equivalent to like an, an INR of two to three. Did I cover everything, Arthur? Or was there- yeah, so, the, so I guess the only other question is my understanding, so you mentioned having an abnormal baseline INR, but it's my understanding that, the, and I think it's specific to lupus on a drag, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that particularly can interfere with the assay itself and, and I see a lot of people talking about, oh, you can't use a point of care test in any, in any APS patient, but it's my understanding that that interaction between lupus anticoagulant and the assay can happen in the laboratory as well. Yeah, so less comp, so you're right. So um, it, it certainly can, and that's the most common reason why somebody with antiphospholipid syndrome will have an abnormal baseline INR. And in that case, again, if, if the INR is 1.5 or higher, I typically wouldn't use the INR for warfarin monitor, and I'd use factor 10. But for the point of care, that now what I've been talking about is laboratory yeah. PT INRs. The point of care INRs are more sensitive to lupus anticoagulants, are more likely to be affected by them. And so um, what I always do with my patients who have antiphospholipid syndrome, if they, there's a desire to use a point of care INR, I make sure that it correlates well with the venous laboratory INR. My rule is 
within 20%, which is still a pretty generous deviation actually. Mm -hmm. But if it's if the deviation is by more than 20%, then I tell them, I'm sorry, but you can't use the point of care INR. Sarah Bishoy, do you guys deal with this issue with it with interactions? And and I know I don't have access to a quick turnaround chromogenic factor 10. So I don't, I can't actually manage a patient with factor 10. What I've done is tried to map an INR based on the the, the send out week-long chromogenic factor 10. What are you guys doing? So I am making it simple, and we're personally just using uh, venipuncture for those patients. Now, if you have a patient who is absolutely, they just, they, they can't um, do it and they want a finger stick, we'll, 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 we'll try to do correlations, but kind of like you in terms of even if the INR is, um, is difficult to kind of read, yeah, our, I believe our send out, my previous facility, the send out was, uh, took a while to come back. Um, so kind of like you, we try to do these, um, hit a moving target um, type thing with it. But I personally, I think I've only had to do it once, thankfully. Um, most things have seemed to correlate okay. So be interested in to see what Sarah says. Yeah, I haven't done it in a really, a chromogenic um, factor 10 in a really long time. And I, I think Arthur, my approach is similar to what you were describing is using them to say, well, correlate it maybe with an INR so that you know when they're this INR correlates with this percentage of anti 10 a or of, of factor 10 activity. And um, then you're not having to do that as, and you know where you are um, and you can extrapolate what your INR means. Um, and to I, do that, you need a few data points. You can't really probably do it based right. on one. Right. And you have to remember that the, that the interaction of the lupus anticoagulant with the test, which again, could be point of care or laboratory um, can fluctuate. Um, and so it may not be a set it and forget it situation. You might need to do this, you know, kind of routinely throughout a year, let's say. But I would say practically speaking, <laughs> yeah, practically speaking, we I echo Bishoy's approach is is we just have these patients do venipuncture INRs to um, again if it's the lupus anticoagulant and there's you know I think less of an issue with the other um, sure. antibodies. So kind of on this lupus anticoagulant and APS sort of thread, um, maybe, maybe Bashoy, do you have, do you have any thoughts about using um, a DOAC in patients um, who are maybe single positive or double positive APS, um, triple positive APS? Like, is there any sort of a cutoff, like, ah, you might be able to use it in single positive, but maybe we shouldn't use it in, in patients who are more significantly positive with APS? Yeah, initially I was a bit more open for single and, and double positive, but the meta-analysis that came out, uh, Mark Crowther was on that and a few other folks, uh, uh, forgive me if I missed anyone on the panel that's on it, but um, it tends to suggest that uh, actually what we end up a little bit more worried about is that now is the arterial thrombosis um, that, that can kind of come to light. So I'm not saying that DOACs are necessarily um, a contraindication by any means, warfarin first line is, you know, what we'll target. But when you start thinking about it, if the warfarin time within therapeutic range is 20%, patients having issues, you can't reliably monitor at that point, you know, you sit the patient down and you'd be like, okay, here's where we could possibly go with this um, and come to a, a decision making. But I, I do want to be uh, you know, careful that we don't say DOACs are absolutely contraindicated. You can't touch them at all. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the guidelines have favored, um, um, you know, avoiding DOACs when they have triple positive or if they have like an arterial presentation of their APS. But if you look at the data that led to those recommendations, I don't think that that gives us a pass on other APS. And to your point, that meta-analysis that came out with Crowder and those guys kind of like tipped the scale for me that we really should be probably in all, and I'll say this, real, <laughs> mm -hmm. confirmed APS um, uh, that we should be favoring Warfarin first line. But Adam, um, Maybe, you know, what are your thoughts on that topic? And, and, and do you have any thoughts to the why? Why are we seeing what we're seeing? And one of the things we're seeing, by the way, is regardless of whether they presented with arterial or venous thrombosis, when they fail therapy, they most commonly fail it with arterial thrombosis, like strokes, which is just spooky. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. And the, the meta-analysis by Bechtelli um, that, that you've, you've been referencing, they did subgroup analyses in that meta-analysis of single and double positive versus triple positive. And in both subgroups, I mean, I think the signal was pretty clear that there's an excess of arterial events with DOACs compared with warfarin. That said, I, I agree with Peshoy. 
I don't think DOACs are absolutely contraindicated. I have patients, for example, with APS who were on DOACs for several years before some of the scary evidence came out. And they've done great on it for years. And, and I think my obligation to those patients and to all patients with APS is to make sure they understand the risks of going on a DOAC. Um, but if as, as long as we're transparent about that, I think that um, it, it's, a, it's an option for them that we shouldn't completely cut off. They just need to be making an informed decision. That's been my stance as well, agreed. Um, all right, Bishoy, we're running low on time. We're going to try to rapid fire some some of these. I'm going to ask you a question that when I first saw it asked in the list of over 80 questions we got, I said, I'm not asking that. And when it showed up three other times, I said, Dad Gummit, I guess I'm asking that. Uh, bridging DOACs. Using bridge therapy for patients prescribed DOACs when they have to interrupt. Hit me. What you got? Well, uh, just uh, uh, avoiding the, the hitting part. But yeah, I it's... <laughs> I guess I would have to understand what they mean by bridging. If they're talking about periprocedural bridging, um, I can go as far as 99.99% to say no. Now, I want to be careful not to be an absolutist. There are instances, and we actually just had a case here at the VA that Dr. Tracy Minicello chimed in on, um, that this patient was a, a just a, a, a walking clot, essentially, had several clots throughout the years, many of them around per the periprocedural time, and they were true clots, uh, some leading to almost, uh, they were life-threatening, uh, sorry, a limb-threatening. Um, so in those cases, you know, time is of the essence there because really what are you gaining? Half-life of a DOAC is uh, about 12 hours. You move to low molecular weight heparin, you're looking about five to eight hours. So you're gaining about four hours. So in those cases, yeah, but I, I would put it in the hands of somebody who holds their nose when they bridge, then you know someone's making the right um, decision at that point. But it should be, I mean, in your entire career, maybe, you know, three or four of them total. So it shouldn't be something that, we're just constantly doing. Um, but besides that, you have to keep in mind what's, what happens when you put a patient on uh, low molecular weight heparin, the, the, the changes in the sense of um, there are opportunities for things to go wrong the more changes that we make. So avoid it. But there are those few instances that are out there like winning the lottery that occasionally you'll hit it. Yeah, and that doesn't, and I'll say, go as far as to say that doesn't replace post-operative VTE prophylaxis. If you're making a decision based on the patient's thromboembolic risk, the topic of what should I do in the immediate 24, 48 hours post-op is a separate question. Mm -hmm. So when we say don't bridge patients on DOACs, now you should be able to start them back and use a DOAC, perhaps a lower dose. But just understand that when we say don't bridge a DOAC, we're referring to for the patient's peri, you know, thromboembolic risk because the kinetics of the drugs are similar. That's what we're talking about. So go ahead, Andrew. Yeah. So ne next, next question, Sarah, um, bridging for subtherapeutic INRs. Um, say you have a patient mechanical mitral valve, you know, they're a higher risk patient. When, if ever, do you consider bridging for subtherapeutic INRs? I rarely do that, to be honest. Um, I just try to boost their warfarin dose and check them back soon. And if they're persistently low, um, for several days, you know, or weeks, okay, I might, you know, as Bishoy said, hold my nose and, you know, bridge them. But um, I will try to sort of plug the plug the whole short term uh, with the warfarin boost and not jump to bridging. Immediately. Sarah, does your opinion change if that valve was recently placed like within the past three months? Yeah, I think I probably would for that. Same for VTE as well. And everyone has kind of their different... Um, thresholds for how soon after a VTE they would rebridge for a subtherapeutic INR. Um, but yes, if it was a recent stroke, you know, recent VTE, um, recent valve, yeah, that would probably change. And does it matter the valve, like a mechanical valve versus Onyx? Um, I mean, Onyx is mechanical, right? So, I mean, for I would sure. say any, um, yeah, I think for any mechanical valve, if it's recent and, you know, they're 1.5 and they're supposed to be 2.5, yeah, I might consider that. Um, but I might even, I don't know, how, what's their, what's their Lovenox hate factor, maybe, <laughs> um, take that into consideration as, as well. Yeah, and I would just remind everyone that, that, that you know, chest guidelines back in the day when there was a, the Bible, uh, chest 2012 being the last one of those recommended against, uh, and actually a couple of iterations, recommended against bridging for single, single. Uh, subtherapeutic INRs. It doesn't say what do you do when they have a run of them. Um, but anyway, uh, probably last question. Gosh, we have so much more stuff to get to. I wish we had two more hours. Um, 
Uh, Jeff, why don't you uh, hit us on Onyx valves, risk factors, um, give us an update on what, what we really need to know about, um, about Onyx valves. How do we treat them differently? Why do they have a different INR range? Should we use aspirin and all of that? Yeah, so so great question. So I the big take home points is Onyx valve still requires warfarin. You cannot use a DOAC like a Pixaban. The good news is, is that in the aortic position, after the first three months, you can use a lower INR target range of 1.5 to 2. That's in addition to aspirin. The Onyx valves are supposed to be combined with a low-dose aspirin. And in part, the reason you can get away with these lower INR targets is because the Onyx valves, the leaflets fully open. So there's no sort of obstruction of flow the way there are with some of the others. And there's a special coating to them that we believe is slightly less thrombogenic. So that's how they've been able to design it uh, to, to have a lower threshold, especially in the aortic position. One of the specific questions related to this is we know that for aortic valves with additional risk factors, they get a high, higher INR range of two in, in the aortic position where you could be two to three. They get a higher INR range when you add risk factors. What do you do with that information when it's an on-X valve? Do you, um, do you change the INR range? Do you not use a 1.5? Do you go all the way to 2.5? So for me, if they have an Onyx valve in the aortic position, my default after three months is to get them to an INR of 1.5 to 2. If they have several risk factors for thrombosis, like a, a severely depressed EF, history of AFib, uh, maybe prior history of stroke, then I'll probably move them into that two to three range, sort of a typical um, uh, mechanical aortic valve range uh, for that patient. Excellent. And you include we have more time, gang. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, we, you include aspirin in the, along with that too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Even Absolutely. with the two yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Gosh, I wish we had more time, guys. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it over to Andrea to, to get us out of here. Thanks everybody for your time and thank you, panelists. Yes. Thank you to our panelists, Arthur Allen, Jeff Barnes, Adam Sucker, um, Bashoy, uh, Ragib, and Sarah Vasquez. Thank you so much for being here for all of your expertise. We appreciate it. Uh, please check us out. Um, we're on YouTube now. Uh, we have our webinar archive there on YouTube, uh, and we'd love for you to share that with colleagues, share it with friends. Um, there's much to be shared. Check out our Rapid Resource Center. Uh, we have Rapid Resources. We have many other resources on all the things you manage on a daily basis. Uh, please uh, share this with colleagues, share it with friends. Here's several of our Rapid Resources. Um, and there are more to come. There's more in the pipeline. We're constantly revising these, and they are great ways to uh, find the information that you need during these times when we don't have time. Our online literature update is very frequently updated twice a month, and we share our most important articles. Um, there's abstracts, you can search by dates, uh, Thesna is coming up next year, April 4th through 6th. It's going to be in Chicago, and we would love for you to register, uh, and we'd love to see you there. And if you register, please note uh, that you are associated with AC Forum. Early bird pricing ends on December 3rd, so get in before it gets expensive. Well, not expensive, but a little bit more pricey. And thank you very much to all of our sponsors. And thank you to all of you who have stuck with us through the end of this webinar. We appreciate you being here. We hope that you learned something today. And we hope that you can take this information and better your care for your patients. Have a great day. Thanks, all.